So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shan. Oh my gosh, I stutter on saying my name. It's like, uh, I'm so glad that my mom gave me this name, Shannon. I work with the Vermont DEC on the Waste Management and Prevention Division team. And this workshop this afternoon is entitled Unleashing the Power of Johnson Sioux Compost Reactors in Vermont. Jim Stiles has been experimenting with producing Johnson Sioux Compost at his home in St. Albans for about 10 years. And his initial reactors were not up to the challenges posed by Vermont's winters because they froze, effectively ending early experiments. So in response, he switched gears. He created his first micro-reactor, and then six more slightly larger reactors in five and 20 gallon buckets respectively, which he moved into his basement for the winter to avoid freezing. So this approach mostly worked, but then suffered from some shortcomings. And so now a new generation of five gallon micro reactors are currently working in his basement. And the results so far include superior management of his lychee and faster processing of feedstocks. And so this hands-on workshop will involve emptying and examining the contents of the reactor to assess its progress. And so I encourage you to participate and share your observations today. And thank you for joining us. Okay, so yeah, thank you for coming. Uh, I don't you know, get out very often. I spend a lot of time at home uh, in my cellar tending my worms and, uh, and all of that. So it's, it's a, a treat for me to, to be able to do this. Um, so I, I came up with a, a, uh, an opening that we'll see how this works. So this is micro reactor Johnson. So usually they're, you know, uh, stand about this high and they're about this big around. But there are lots of reasons to believe, including a uh, word from David Johnson who says, yeah, I think that'd work. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try it then. Uh, that, uh, uh, that, you know, this is, it's worth a try. And uh, uh, also, it, you know, one thing that in his more recent talks that David talks about a lot is that, uh, you know, this is vermicompost. And then you know, a little light went on in my head saying, ah, fermicompost, that one's been solved pretty darn well. Uh, why don't I learn from that? And uh, uh, you know, sort of use that as a starting point, but just with an ex a really uh, extended uh, aging, uh, the uh, curing time. Uh, so we can see what kind of biology we can generate and how well that can work. Uh, that's the logic. Um, and based on the work that I did for my previous presentation two years ago and the slightly larger pots, um, uh, I have, uh, it's very anecdotal and please be skeptical, but uh, uh, after I allowed the pots that I did uh, the same thing uh, two years ago, uh, 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 they, I let them finish uh, aging through the summer. At the end of the summer, it was getting cold out, and I said, ah, well, do I want to put them in my, in my cellar for another year? No. Uh, and so I just broke them down and just spread it all around, said, well, okay. And, uh, uh, and then when I was done applying it in the way that I thought was appropriate, I had some extra left. And so I took that extra. I dumped it uh, along the south border of my uh, property uh, between uh, my largest chinkapin hybrid, chinkapin chestnut hybrid, and uh, one that had really suffered badly, uh, was this tiny little thing. Uh, and I said, well, okay, you know, I didn't even really think about it. Uh, but then the next year, the following year, all my garden generally seemed to do pretty well. It was like, oh, that's, that's nice. But those two trees, it was just absolutely, in fact, my neighbors on that side commented on it and said, whoa, that tree has done amazingly well. Is that scientific result? No. But it's very intriguing uh, that it went, the, the larger one went from approximately six feet high to at least 12 feet high. And beautiful growth, I mean, just really gorgeous. Uh, and the one that had started out the year it, that had been much abused, been browsed by rabbits and, and all kinds of you know, nasty things you can do to uh, little uh, sprouting trees, uh, that went from about six inches high to three feet high. 
and it's very nice. So uh, pretty, it's anecdotal. Don't, don't read too much into it, but you know, uh, it certainly caught my attention. So, okay, but now back to where I tried to start. Uh, according to David Johnson's latest uh, approaches to applying Johnson Sioux compost, uh, he applies um, his finished compost at the rate of two pounds per acre. By that measure, this is 12 to 16 acres worth of soil supplement. Once it's done, it's, this is less than half the way there is my guess at this point. We'll know more after we've torn into it. Oh, by the way, before I tear into it, there was maybe gonna be a plastic sheet or something for the top here, or we're we not gonna worry about that. Supplies for oh, afterwards. Good. And, the, and, and, and a tarp. The oh, a spider. Oh, yeah. I probably brought it with me. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I'll make sure that doesn't stay inside. We'll go back. Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, I, you know, that is, you know, the sort of the, the big hope and promise of Johnson Sioux Compost is that instead of having uh, massive applications, ton or two tons, you know, me measuring application in tons per acre, you measure it in pounds per acre. And so nutrient pollution should be, if everything works as, it, as we hope, uh, should be pretty much eliminated. So, uh, and the nice thing about this is that, you know, this scale, uh, if that's say 12, uh, 12 acres worth of compost, uh, well, it's enough for your backyard, that's for sure. And if you apply it at higher rates, uh, it's not necessarily uh, cost effective if you are doing, uh, you know, uh, tens or hundreds of acres, you know, you, you want to keep your application rates low. But if you're just doing it in your home and you apply a little more than, well, actually the, the uh, soil uh, uh, benefits uh, actually are increased by increasing rates of application. It's not the most cost effective way to do it, but it's a very effective uh, way to improve your soil and to uh, improve your results. Uh, let's see, what else was I gonna time? Yeah, curing over the course of the summer. Yep. Um, so, yeah, this is getting on to the sort of the next stage of the presentation, which is uh, when I did take uh, uh, the, uh, the pots that I'd done, the larger pots before, and broke them down, uh, I found that to be, again, a very interesting exercise. The, uh, the, the, the level of decomposition was not especially good, I didn't think. Uh, clearly it was composting, it was biologically active, it was going forward, uh, but there was still a lot of completely undigested material, uh, mostly because uh, I, think, I think the single biggest factor is my cellar is so cold. Uh, it just wasn't enough uh, to really, you know, maximize my uh, uh, decomposition rate. Also, I probably uh, failed to keep it as wet as it should have been. So, you know, bad, bad on me, you know, bad technique. Uh, oh, yes. Sorry, I had a quick question. Yes. I'm very new to this, so yeah. I'm just trying to understand. So, uh, Johnson Sue is a company which produces compost, and you're trying to get to, trying to produce it as good as they do. Okay. Or do you do uh, sell your compost to them? Uh, no. Uh, okay. Excellent question. I apologize for jumping in no. too fast, <laughs> but I'm, I'm very happy to uh, backfill I'm when I... I'm to this, so I'm just trying to understand. Background yeah. as well. I was yeah. kind of yeah. curious. Yeah. Yeah. Two pounds an acre was really interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, David Johnson uh, is, a uh, is a researcher at New Mexico State University. He's also on the fac faculty of Ch um, Chico State in California, where they've uh, conducted some major operations, uh, major research. Uh, so he's a researcher uh, uh, with a background in uh, 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 microbiology, soil microbiologist. Um, that's what his PhD was in. Uh, and he actually uh, got uh, headed in this direction. There were, I guess, two major contributing factors. One was that his first uh, um, uh, research project 
was to figure out what to do with all that cow manure uh, in the uh, farms around uh, uh, Las Cruces, New Mexico. Uh, and the other thing was he uh, learned of this woman, um, uh, Elaine Ingham, who uh, uh, Jay uh, has uh, taken her course, and he took that same course, it's just a much earlier version of it. Uh, actually, Kat, you took it too. Um, and uh, uh, and it just got him thinking, and he said... David's wife was a big part of this too, don't forget her. Right. Uh, I, I've always wondered about her role. I mean, she, David certainly gives her credit uh, for a lot of... I think she's done a lot of the analysis. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and I can't remember the question. Oh, uh, Hui Chun Su, I think. Oh, okay, so that's how it comes, Johnson Su. Yeah. Okay. And that's... that's uh, good, we got there. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. I have one thing, it's a team right. question. Yes. Um, my understanding of Johnson Sioux composting is that it doesn't always involve food waste. Is that true? Uh, right. That typically it's leaf and yard waste and manures, as you mentioned, but because um, I remember learning about the experiments in New Mexico collecting leaf and yard waste and how much um, organic matter that added into the soil, how it helped the soil retain more moisture. And so I've always thought yeah. leaf and yard waste, um, but not food scraps. And so is that distinction true for the most part? Uh, as a practical matter, yes. As a, uh, uh, as, a, as, as a limiting factor, probably not. Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, uh, David uh, started out uh, looking for ways to get rid of cow manure. Yeah. And so he needed to you know, balance that out, get, get some kind of decent carbon-nitrogen ratio. And what was convenient for him was uh, actually Ramiel wood chips were part of the original mix that uh, he did. And then so one-third Ramiel wood chips, one-third uh, yard waste, and one-third manure was and, but over the years, uh, he has tried lots of different feedstocks. Uh, he hasn't documented it particularly well, but uh, you know he, he lists off all kinds of different things. You know, moldy hay, uh, Timothy. Uh, you know, um, I, but I guess that uh, in a couple of his videos, he has mentioned that uh, leaves, just uh, uh, shredded leaves, really work well. So I've got shredded leaves. I have a neighbor who, uh, you know, shreds them for me. He just he wants to get rid of them. He gives them to me. I I play games with them. Uh, so that works for me. Uh, okay. Yeah, great, thank you. Uh, so how do you know like whether or not it's like achieved the goals? Um, that is a great question. Yeah. Unfortunately. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, one of the things that got me very interested in Johnson Sioux uh, compost early on was uh, uh, the uh, my experience going to visit um, St. Lawrence uh, St. Lawrence Nurseries in Potsdam, uh, and um, Bill, who uh, who owned it at that time, uh, had been in touch with uh, David, and. Uh, uh, David had sent him a bunch of uh, uh, compost to use in a trial. Uh, uh, actually, I'm sorry, not a trial, but in a test thing for a 4-H project that he was heading up. Uh, and so I just happened to show up when, when the box was you know, pretty well empty, but we sat around and said, wow, this is interesting stuff, and we grabbed handfuls of it. and mush it around, and it was really just like clay, almost, except it, it was a very greasy kind of feel. I think that's probably from the uh, bacteria, if I'm not mistaken, that they make things that give that greasy feel. Uh, and um, the only thing you could really say is that if you looked really closely, you tend to get some tiny little flecks of what looked like mostly broken down leaf. But other than that, it was a very smooth texture. And for years, I equated that with good stuff because there are really no measures. Uh, I have tried to, I've actually corresponded with David a little bit about you know, uh, good ways to do testing to say whether it actually is good. And 
uh, I think the only way that he's found that he thinks is really uh, viable, you know, really gives a good answer is uh, metagenomic analysis. If you have something, I, th I think this number is about right, but 25 million species uh, with a fairly equal distribution among various classes uh, of, of those uh, species. Uh, so you've got you know, a massive diversity uh, from th those two measures. Then it's good compost. Uh, furthermore, it's important to have the, uh, the bacterial counts uh, and I'm not going to remember a number here, but it's, uh, uh, you know, like 10,000 per, I don't know, the unit escapes me. But you, you want to have, a, you know, a large number of microbes, good distribution of those. If you don't have enough microbes, just add, just throw more compost onto it, and that works. Uh, that's what uh, Dave uh, West does. Uh, he isn't satisfied that he gets enough quantity, so he, instead of recommending an application rate of two pounds per acre, Dave, uh, Dave West, who's the, I think probably the biggest commercial producer of this, uh, recommends three pounds per acre. His customers seem to be happy. So a lot of this stuff, <laughs> there's a lot of work to be done before this is really uh, a viable uh, approach for commercial, but yeah. My understanding is that Johnson's soup compost has a higher fungal to bacteria ratio. Fungal bacteria ratio is much higher. Most food scraps compost is going to be a much higher bacteria to fungal ratio. It starts that way, but uh, apparently the curing process, can the curing process uh, apparently is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. All these very diverse uh, feedstocks, and he really has, you, you hear the list of things he's tried, and really different. And they all wind up with that same, you know, high, uh, good fungal bacterial ratio, large numbers of microbes, large, uh, but mostly diversity, uh, and uh, of, uh, you know, of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I can I throw one thing in? Please. Because you're asking about ways to quantify like metagenomic analysis, like qPCR, like super expensive, and you're not guaranteed to be able to actually you know, identify everything that you see. So like Elaine Ingham's whole approach is that there are certain standards and it's extrapolative, like you're looking at samples. And then from there, if you've taken representative samples, you can extrapolate that data and say, well, there's, you know, X micrograms of bacterial biomass per gram of soil or compost. Same thing with fungi, protozoa, et cetera. So in theory, if, if you're making an inoculum like this that has a ton of microbiology, then you're going to see that in the microscope. And when you do the calculations, you're going to end up with substantially higher microbiomass micro counts. And it's like, like it's a fraction of the cost in, in time for metagenomic analysis. Would be yeah, we were working on an in-vessel system with a guy out of Minnesota, Jimmy Sinton, in Minnesota, North Dakota. He wanted, and he was working with Elaine. And, um, um, and it, we basically built this like super controlled like vessel in the dumpster that was about 14 cubic yards, <clears throat> and uh, we sent the samples out to Elaine's lab, and they looked at him like these are shit. <laughs> like I don't know, but um, so yeah, I think they were looking at more the microscope, but it was really hard to tell. Yeah, right. I think ours is hot probably, but yeah, you know, it, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's different parameters you want to control. I think, you know, as I've thought about this more, uh, uh, assays, bioassays, I think might be uh, an affordable way to, mm -hmm. to test this. Uh, uh, and some early uh, work he did about germination, his germination rates and er early growth rates were phenomenal. And so I think that uh, bioassay might well be a, a good uh, test of the quality of what you're doing. you're inoculating your, your soil. And you should see a response on the landscape, right? That's like the right. end result. Right. So, I don't know if that can, that can be measured. Uh, sure. I mean, if, if you know. Measuring. Well, the plant bioassay is usually thought of as kind of the gold standard as far as you don't want it to be phytotoxic. So, you got to see to make sure your plants, your right. seeds are germinating and your plants are growing. Right. Right. So and hopefully growing vigorously. That's right. why a lot of people don't do it because it might take you three weeks or longer. Right. To get a result, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. We've developed one that's kind of based on radish seeds 
So it grows, it germinates fast. really fast. Uh -huh. Within three weeks, anywhere. we're good. <laughs> yeah, but we can really tell the difference between those that, you know, are phytotoxic or promote sure. growth. Yeah, and so and 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 you know David with the the his early work on the bioassay stuff uh, reported you know very different growth rates uh, percentage germination and growth rates both were very high. And that's something everybody could do at home. It's right. Like you have kind of a controlled growth. You know, if you're growing house plants or whatever, you should be able to have seedlings or greenhouse. Right, and, yeah. and you can even do multiple controls with yeah. something like that. You know, here's the Johnson Sioux okay. Su stuff, here's the tap water, here's the, you know, whatever, uh, various media. Yeah, so. so yeah, uh, just to add to that question, um, so when you are, uh, when the compost is getting created, are you testing for like, that it's hitting the right temperatures, like the moisture is right? Um, I have not done uh, any of that, uh, and it's based largely on rules of thumb, which is get it good and wet when you put it in and keep watering it regularly uh, up to the point of, you know, the water flowing through the system and exiting, try to minimize the leachate. Uh, and part of what I've done uh, that I'm a big fan of after having created a huge mess my first time around where I overwatered my, uh, I think they are actually 10 gallon bags and made a mess of my cellar floor. And my wife is still pissed <laughs> about that. Uh, well, it didn't smell very good either. Actually, the smell wasn't bad, but the stains were just, oh, just. Like yeah. tannin stains. Tannin, tannin, tannin stains, tannin. yeah, bad stuff. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Uh, so I decided I wasn't going to do that again. So uh, 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 it, my my uh, new system, uh, I took a, a plastic uh, bin shell about this deep, about like this, uh, and put in a cubic yard of biochar, and then just set these two on top, uh, wrapped a heating pad around one of them, created an insulated enclosure with a lid, and they seem much happier. Everything really just huge improvement there. It's like a spa for compost. Well, yes. Your, your idea that it was low temperatures. That was right. Back. Right. It. It. it yeah. really which is a reason to suspect it as well. But uh, regardless of it, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. I just wanted to make a comment on your question of reaching certain temperatures. Oh. Oh. Yes. Um, Thank you. If, if you were thinking. Of that we're you thinking of with regards to reducing the path pathogens. Yeah. Um, that probably would be more managed with the feed stock that you use and not using diseased plants or like putting in weed seed. So do you have anything to say about like do you ever put in like diseased plants into this mixture or anything like that that might pass on to um, you know the soil that you that you apply it on or do you specifically source what you think to be clean materials or what you assume to be clean well they come from my yard and I assume that they're clean uh, although in fact to a point that you've made previously in conversations uh, I've got um, uh, jumping worms like crazy in my yard and yet I don't see any signs of jumping worms in these. Uh, please keep your eyes peeled as we tear into it. Uh, see if, if you see any jumping worms, please let me know. But usually it, there's never just one. So uh, I think we're OK, which is pretty interesting. But uh, the other thing is, uh, and this is one place where, Deb, you might possibly want to offer an opinion as well. But um, uh, you, you take you know, a good clean feed stock. I, mine are primarily, um, what you call it? Um, Bastard dude is what we call it in our neighborhood. But it's the um, um, bishop's weed. Uh, what, it's the, 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 the weed that you got. It, that, Japanese knotweed? No. Five bishop's weed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, gout weed. Also. Gout weed, oh. yeah. This, uh, the, the, the initial feedstock here was gout, dried gout weed. It didn't all die, uh, as is evidenced by sprouts. They keep coming up. 
uh, and then I shifted to dried weeds, uh, to, to dried leaves rather, that uh, uh, came from the yard. Uh, so I've got good feedstock, uh, but the, uh, the other thing is that uh, David Johnson has reported that he doesn't seem to find any uh, pathogenic problems with his well-cured soil because at that point, uh, it's, the soil has been invaded by every organism you can imagine. And it's got to fight its way in, and, and lots, lots of pathogens are, are in there. There are all kinds of pathogens in, that he reports finding, but there's no disease. Again, this should be test, checked very carefully, but uh, you know, the presence of pathogens does not mean disease, necessarily. Well, because there's also, do you mind if I just make a point? Please. It, you know, not all, but there's a lot of plant pathogens that are facultative anaerobes, so they require, you know, like certain, certain conditions. conditions. Yeah, like four to six parts per million oxygen to thrive and to outcompete, you know, plant beneficial saprophytic fungi, right? So if you have an incredibly diverse array of different fungal species that are all aerobic, and that's one of the keys is like keeping the system aerobic even without turning or forced aeration, then you're going to cultivate beneficial microbes that. Also, a lot of those fungi work with diverse enzymes. So like a lot of bacteria will, will use like a single enzyme to solubilize like a single mineral. Not all, but, but a lot. Whereas fungi can work with a lot of different enzymes. So you can get potentially neutralization of like, like I think about leaves and you can have in an urban environment like polycyclic hydrocarbons and that can be a problem that can persist in compost, right? But if you have like a really diverse fungal base, then there's a higher chance that even those hydrocarbons could be broken down through some combination of different fungal actors. So that's the idea is you've made something that's biologically so much more diverse that not a lot of pathogenic or toxic materials can stand up to it in the way that they could in like a traditional like wind road compost system. Right. It is the idea. Yeah, and it's not to say that it can't happen, it can happen, but you know, the experience uh, uh, of various experimenters seems to indicate not a big one. Which, could you speak about his work with the Howard Buffett Foundation? Just because oh, that's where the results are being proven out. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, just uh, I actually touched base with a bunch of experimenters I've corresponded with prior, you know, to get updates. And uh, I can share some of those others. but. Uh, the email I got from, back from David is actually included at the tail end of this sheet. There are a couple of copies here, uh, and I'm happy to uh, uh, provide copy. You know, uh, I'll email you, you know, copies of that email if you want. But uh, uh, he, he has been very closed-mouthed about a, a five-year full-scale field trial taking place uh, in Wilcox, Arizona, at the Howard Buffett. Uh, uh, foundation funded research station there. Uh, he did release preliminary results three years, three going on four years ago now. Uh, uh, w very exciting uh, results. Uh, I, I wrote a paper for Eric Roy for a, a course that I was taking with him, and he didn't really like the results much, which is weird, but anyway, uh, I, they, they really blew me away, which basically. Uh, had that um, uh, he um, uh, the the uh, total productivity between conventional, which I think was 175 pounds per acre of urea, was was the fertilizer in question there. Uh, again, be suspicious suspicious of that number, but it's it's ballpark. Uh, that was his control, which was the standard being used on other plots and at their facility. Uh, the, and then he did two experimental, which was uh, one was just two pounds per acre of the Johnson Sioux compost and nothing else. And then uh, uh, the other was two pounds per acre of the uh, Johnson Sioux compost plus 15% of whatever the uh, the standard, you know, control dosage of urea was, uh, and the results of that test uh, were that, in some cases, the highest productivity uh, was the conventional, in some cases, it was the the hybrid, 
Uh, but in all cases, uh, but or rather in no cases, was the standard the most profitable because of the cost of a couple hundred pounds per acre of urea versus two pounds per acre of this stuff. So it's provided uh, uh, benefits to the farmer, uh, this, in this case Howard Buffett, who de doesn't need the money, uh, but um, uh, in improved uh, economic output in the first year. And, those, and, and then he also reported in a second year with a different crop, uh, and the, the uh, results improved even more in favor of the Johnson Sioux. Since then, he has completely shut down uh, any information uh, coming out about this project, uh, which is very frustrating for me because it was a five-year project. Five years have come and gone. Uh, no data. Uh, I asked him in my latest email and said, I've been asked to not share those results until we're ready to release them. Uh, a year and a half ago, I got a couple of questions into him on a, a, uh, a Zoom session, and I was kind of persistent. Uh, and he said, well, you know, I can't give you any real numbers, but we're kind of happy. That's, that's all the information I have, which leads me to speculate endlessly about what's going on. You know, after all, Howard Buffett is Warren Buffett's son. And therefore, billionaires, incredibly rich people, are really watching this, and you know, good rich people, because Howard Buffett, you know, when you're talking about near trillionaires, he's about as good as you get. Uh, that, so maybe something really good is going to be released soon, I would like to think. But, the, but like ostensibly the research that the Howard Buffett Foundation is doing ostensibly is being done in order to create composting and fertility schemas that can be replicated in like sub-Saharan African you. Yes. villages on like marginal arid soils. So the idea is a compost that doesn't require a bunch of heavy equipment to assemble, doesn't require electricity, can be made at a village scale, applied, and can completely rebuild the soils in, in, in the context of like subsistence agriculture. Especially in places that are seeing like demographic growth and need to be able to sustain the population with their own food supply. So that's like ostensibly what the research is for. And you can look it up. Um, there are websites, and even from like 2016, there's results with like, I mean, data and pictures of side by sides that are remarkable, and they're in a really harsh. I mean, Wilcox is like low elevation, hardcore desert, you know, like saline soic soils. It's it's a rough place, and like it, it's yeah, what they're doing. Somewhere, because so. I'm sure you're going to want to spread stuff out, right? Right, right. The yeah. Thank you. Fact, Deb, if you want to get some gloves too, you would be yeah, and very welcome. Yeah. Right, right. Find like there, there's like a PDF from 2016 that was a presentation that he and his wife put together, um, and yeah, if you if you can find that, I mean it's online. If you can find it, that's where there's a lot. Of Everyone's welcome. Hey Noah, come on, get some gloves on. Oh, I'm gonna get dirty. <laughs> okay, this is it. You can talk all day, but you got to look at it. <laughs> Okay, so I transitioned. You got a lot of worms. Yeah, it's really like you can see them. Just some extra protection. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a genus. That's what the, this looks yeah. like the one that you might use in vermicompost. Yeah, that's what I, why I bought it. Red Wiggler, we call it. Red Wiggler is uh, what I bought. <laughs> what I paid for, at least. So. So those are earthworms that tend to be near the surface. Right. Which is actually something I've wondered about. I had a discussion with uh, Joseph Gores about yeah. this, and he said, oh, yeah, there is we that, go. Is that your gout weed? That's my gout weed. Still, <laughs> Still growing. Still growing. Uh, doesn't look like you've had a good kid. Quite got it. No. Nah. Would anyone not like to be photographed? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. Thanks for asking this point. So there's, uh, I think that's spaghetti squash. Uh, they, they really do love curcubits. Uh, I guess any vermicomposter will tell you that. But there's a lot of pumpkin uh, that's been fed in here, a fair amount of pumpkin squash. Uh, I started out using, uh, well, actually, the, the base in here is actually coconut coir. And so I haven't really seen that now for 
seven or eight months. How so, old is this? Uh, about seven or eight months. Seven or eight months. Right. So you yeah, like later, or how do you? Um, yeah, I mean the the coconut choir was just you know uh, Rhonda Fleming, uh, mm -hmm. her, her 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 book, which is oh, okay. great. Uh, said coconut choir is nice, and yeah. tur turns out that I've. I actually had some kicking around, so, <laughs> okay, let's do that. The only downside, yeah, it's not very sustainable, is you have to bring it from so far away. Right. You can see the little spring tails, or I think that's the little mites I'm seeing. This is beautiful. Oh, there's all kinds of little bugs in here. So it's clar and squash and leaves? Mm -hmm. Looks uh, like a lot of leaves is what you're seeing a lot here. Yeah. But, but this one is the, 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 the epidermis of you, right. uh, the squash, looks like butternut right. or something. What did you put in? What's like the feedstock? Uh, well, a I, I mean, I started out, the, the first uh, input was the bedding of the coconut coir, okay. uh, then followed primarily with the gout, uh, gout weed. Uh -huh. uh, and then I started feeding it curcubits. Uh, and they, they did really well after uh, uh, Halloween. They yeah. loved Halloween. Well, and everybody's throwing their pumpkins out. <laughs> exactly. Out is there the curve. Room, like bottom up in layers, basically. Yeah, I wouldn't call it a layer. I'd just say it's the, it's the next lump. This is being you know. Oh, uh, but also uh, oh, yeah. various yeah. greens yeah. from uh, from the house. Uh, uh, there's probably some big lumps of uh, cauliflower in here. Uh, I don't know if we don't see any lumps, then uh, then the uh, worms have really. Uh, but I yeah. chowed down on it. But a little bit dry so you, there. So you bought the worms and added them? I did. Them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I did. Oh, there's. Oh, they're so beautiful. Right. Well, and temp worms and temperature are really important because if it gets too cold, very dry. Die. So. Or too hot. Yeah, yeah they're pretty picky. I think I didn't pre-wet some of this stuff. Little, little Goldilocks is these ones, right? Oh, hot. <laughs> How long would you typically cold. give well, like a bucket before buying it? I'm sorry, say again? How long would you typically give like the system to work its way through before <laughs> applying it to the That's just loaded. Well, the, um, uh, the standard really rule from uh, David uh, Johnson is once you fill a, a reactor, uh, you need to give it at least a year. 14 months is probably better, uh, but you get a feel for it after you've done it a couple of times. Uh, I think my, even with the heating pad I put on here, I suspect it's still a little cold. What temperature here, is this it turned is, in? This is the I'm sorry? What's the temperature you're shooting for? Uh, well, I think red wigglers prefer somewhere right in the vicinity of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. Is there like a range? Uh, yeah, they're they're fairly tolerant. Um, yeah, mine live at like 45. They're really slow high in the winter. They're like, don't feed me too much. Right. Yeah. 45 is at the lower limit. Yeah, that's sort of. my sort of yeah, would, zone. It, it, yeah. They, they can still eat in the winter, but they feed them a lot less. So the like Johnson suit does not, well, obviously worms are involved. Like, say, if you had this system outside, Mm -hmm. But since you have it inside, do you need to add the worms? Uh, you, as they're the because well, no, the fungus is also decomposing it as well. But right. Have you have you tried systems without adding the worms? In? Not at this point. In fact, in, uh, David specifically describes his uh, uh, his compost as a type of vermicompost. Yeah. Well, the worms bring in a whole microbiome themselves. Right. Yeah. So it's a way of really and actually the research I've done shows. You know, there's a lot of microbes that can be disease suppressive in the earthworms. Sure. Inside yeah. the worms. Inside the worms that they're adding. Right, because they're actually eating the microbes, right? On the well, they're actually, worms are one of the few that are actually eating the detritus. <laughs> Although that varies with species, Although, doesn't it? I mean, the. Yeah, I think it does, you know. But I, most of them are after the microbes and they're just shredding it to get right, to the to microbes. Right, increase the right? surface area. Yeah, yeah, microbes, yeah. Microbes, exactly. Yeah. Well, that's probably part of part of the key is that you have this combination between like high fungal biomass in the end, but also mineralized. I think that's the a, so a chunk of violet roots, roots that uh, also oh, yeah. they okay. didn't they didn't oh, like. Yeah, they, yeah. Not it. they yeah. get so it gets so uh, so much so like lignin here and wood. Right. Short and long term. Break it down. Those are the right. ones you really right. want to have in small pieces. Right. 
Well, uh, you know, I just like to try lots of different things. Get more damage and get sure and it's like technical. Yeah. So, Jim, you stack these buckets then, don't do you? Like, uh, no, these you guys, are. You just sit on the floor of your cellar? Uh, no, I, I, I said, okay, so I've got my plastic tray, uh, a cubic foot of biochar in there. Uh, and then I set this directly onto the biochar. Okay. okay, so all of your leachage is going to uh, capture it in the biochar. Uh, Correct. Yeah, I wonder how you dealt with your leachage. Yeah. And then you just do single buckets, and then you said you put your mixture in, add worms, and you've just been letting them kind of rot. Basically, just give them water. Just give them water, keep them warm. You know. I was trying to figure yeah. out what they were. I need, this, I need to see them under higher mi magnification. Yeah. There's these little guys that just look like. I think there's robots. some of them are just like this is fungus gnats or. What's the. Um, yeah. what you keep, I it's thought a there was some rice, but I think you can move it around too fast. Or it's just the feed, you're just putting feed stocks in a just five gallon bucket. Feed, feed stocks in a. Uh, and, oh, right. He, he, um, this is starting to jump towards my conclusion <laughs> and the next version, but. I think a plastic bucket is probably not the optimal thing. Mm -hmm. I did a 10-gallon uh, wow. fabric uh, pot before. Sure. I decided to try five-gallon buckets. I think it's working. Yeah. Uh, but I think that uh, I really like the fabric pots better. Just oxygen. Exactly. Oxygen. One of the things I read about in David's work is that you're looking sure. for air every foot like no right. no greater than one foot without uh, ox, air ox which is why they insert the right. pvc yeah. pipes into a johnson suit right so you know i you don't want it to go anaerobic if it gets too wet and you don't have that then right that's going to slow it down even more and it's going to smell bad right <laughs> right but in you fact, it goes bad. Yeah. yeah, it shouldn't smell. Right, right. <laughs> well, you have a challenge because these bioreactors are taller than they are wide. It's definitely so loaded with action and stratification. It's like you want to avoid that. So, like, the, the passive air channeling is really important. So, we have they worms all the way through getting yeah. down yeah. into the. You've got a good, healthy population of worms. Pot, so, the idea is ah. doing they, they look good to me, but yeah, I, I, I'm look. very pleased that. Somebody who actually knows about this stuff. I'm is not necessarily an earthworm specialist. Oh, so, you've got so much but you got a big population. Uh huh. So this is and another. What was it said eight? You know, so another well, four or five so more. more finished. Finished. This is what you would apply, like the leftovers. It is looking more finished at the bottom. I would say yes. Because I think there's a well, species yeah. here. But I think we're getting yeah, into. Mary would be fantastic. Yeah. That one looks stuff, different. That, you know, you can really. I don't think I've seen much by way of uh, so it's not, of uh, pumpkin you know, it's not uh, shell so we, skin. Okay. There is a graduate. Yeah. Or, well, she's yeah. not yeah. a graduate yeah. student yeah. anymore, but. She knows earthworm yeah. species. Uh -huh. and she's down at the jumping worm. Yeah, we need to see it. Oh, okay. Uh, workshop right now, Mario. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. you, yeah. you can show her some of these worms and she can tell you. Well, I mean, I'm trying to decide if you have one species or a couple species. Apparently, it's pretty common for red wigglers to be mixed. There's an Indio. There's a couple different ones, isn't it? I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I. I don't. I'm not an expert for sure, but it has air channels also. So I'm curious about the leachation. How do you collect that? Manage it, use it. I haven't used it yet. Well, actually, I recycle it. There are holes on the bottom of the bucket. There is a big, big hole right in the bottom. So, but I mean, I've got a big plastic container, you know. And, uh, and then put in biochar and just to lift it up a little bit and to start to, and also I figure that it's probably a fine thing yeah. if I get, um, uh, when I drain the excess water out of that, the leachate, uh, drain it into a large uh, watering can that I keep nearby. Yeah. And then I just okay. pour it back on the top to keep it wet. Yeah. Uh, and so far, I've been very pleased with that. So now we're coming into an, another stratum here. All, all the good stuff. And because you're not actually, yeah. It's amazing to think you're not adding carbon in two pounds per acre. Like, that that blows me away too. Two, two or three but pounds. But that's like yeah. usually people are doing ten to twenty tons. Right, right. And it's still not a very thick I cover. Like, right. This, I mean, my understanding is this yeah. is like an inoculum, right? That right. A little okay. bit goes a long way, but but it would be kind of like a little bit here and then a little bit here. Well, that's what it seems like. Yeah. 
even think you can see it. it. No, yeah. Yeah. And in fact, apparently you can. Uh, so I, I tried 20 to 20 to tell the gas, and I thought that was just too far But and, and in fact, what you do is you, you take this two pounds of this, throw it into 20 gallons of water. Oh, okay. And, that's what you're doing. And, and so you're ap right. applying that's the water. You, that's how you can make it more uniform. Exactly. And then uh, it's not an ex it's a dilution. Not, not an extract, a dilution. Uh, I just want to be respectful of the, of the volume. Yeah, just in case. Okay. Is your own one a different one, or is it more of the same? It's more of the same. Okay. I just didn't want to make one. I know what you're just talking about, that you make a dilution. Uh, okay, yes. Okay. We're just getting a little sore, people. She just... And if there's worms that you're not sure what are, you can take it over to the jumping room. Mary, yeah. first yeah. two doors down. This is what you're talking about, the greasy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, like towards the bottom, like your castings are really building up here, right? Is that, that kind of how you castings, understand it? Because uh, this stuff looks way more processed. You mind if I put some of this out? Yeah, yeah put it out. Well, no, this is at some point, well, we're getting into this looks great. quar maybe. Okay. This may be okay, it's settling towards the bottom. It's settling. This has still got a long ways to go. Right, that's got a long ways to go for sure. Yeah, but totally, especially where your stuff is leaching out. This looks, it could be core, but. Yeah, it, it, looks, more, it looks more broken down. It has that okay. greasiness of like that humic acid, you know, like whenever you feel like humus rich soil. It's not it's as. like soapy. Right, you know, it's not as greasy as, or soapy as, as some that I've seen, but I, I would say that's not really very much broken down. That, Really? Because when I put the quar in, that was very much the consistency. Oh, yeah. Was, oh. How much did you mix it when you put it in? I, you just put a quar on the bottom. Just quar on the bottom. Uh, just okay. a starting place so that they would have a place to hide. Yeah. And how much and, do you add at a time? How, how much I got? You know, yeah. it's it's. <laughs> Uh, but you don't spill the bucket up all at once, right? Well, in fact, I think that's the right way to do it. Do. Yeah, batch. I, would uh, think. Yeah. I mean, that's how you build well, the reactors, is you're doing the whole thing at the once. The whole thing at once. Um, but, in fact, you can do subsequent additions as well. So no reason to not fill it up with nice, wet, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, leaves. I, uh, I'm really liking the, uh, the, the shredded leaves as a primary feedstock. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's one that uh, David Johnson favors as well. So, okay. You soak your leaves, you but so, shred them, and then soak them. Uh, shred them, soak them, uh, and then throw them in, and f fill it up, uh, and then start adding, you know, other things. Curcubits, they really love curcubits. Uh, whatever you've got, and keep feeding it down. And the way I'm thinking about this is that, you know. Uh, after the initial batch goes in and, and has been there for about a year, uh, oh, potato. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the root was getting mentioned as a weed, but I was like, I think it's a potato. Well, that, that, one's, <laughs> that one's potato. Yeah. Uh, so. Jim, did you bring any plastic bags? Because I'd love to take like some of that and some of this and look at it with a microscope. Grab a glove, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So there's uh, no manure in that manure. No manure. Uh, yeah. Do you target, uh, uh, you know, different types of leaves, or do you don't care? Like Not maple very much. Oh, because they can be different in their composition. Uh, we've got a lot of maple where we are. And they tend to decompose yeah. really quickly. Uh -huh. yeah. The oak can be a little harder. Yeah, down. and we just, there's a little of that down the street for me, but that would be more work. Sure. So. They might throw things off. Yeah. But yeah, dig down around in there. Just like old peels. Yeah, peels. And but a lot of worms hanging out at the bottom, right? So the one like the vermicomposting systems that I've seen like people do at home, they do a lot of the fabric pots yeah. stacked on top of each other or plastic bins like this. But I mean, yeah, if you just score at the bottom, I understand you can see some of the fibers like yeah, that are still sticking around maybe, but at least with the worm action, they're bringing that material down and they're, you know, they're gradually kind of turning it, right? right? You have some straw in here or something? Um, I'm trying to think what that is. Um, I, I think it's just uh, some weed stems that were dried. They haven't really gone gone very far. So um, can you talk a little bit about your application as a, a tea and extract 
or you were mentioning diluted? Sure. Uh, so people have tried all kinds of stuff here, and apparently it all works pretty well. But um, the standard methodology that uh, David Johnson uh, does now is he just takes two pounds of this stuff uh, after it's, it's completed uh, and throws it into 20 gallons of water and then just and then applies the water. That's all. Uh, and he doesn't see the need to do anything other than that, and that makes sense to me. Now, I think they're wonderful is questions. Is he agitating the tank to, to keep yes. it aerated? Uh, well, uh, he doesn't he do it in advance. Like he, you know, right. it's but oh, okay. Like, it's it goes uh, on the tank and on the machine, and, and it's right. agitated to keep right. it as it's being spread. As it's being spread. <laughs> right. And in fact, just bounce, the bouncing yeah, the tractor is enough to right. keep it going as long as they're moving. So right. I mean, he does it fresh really every day. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's you also know, been on the mixture of the every day. Yeah. So it may have converted. So that makes that makes a lot of sense. I think some people were confused about like how this small amount of mass spread, but when you're you're knocking those organisms. Off into the water and then spraying that. And, and into the water, but also the, the things are being knocked off of. Yeah, so you went they're going down there too. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that great? Yeah. So it's all going Check to the same place. Piles. Right, that right. Was really, that was really Interesting, yeah. So, so it, just, I, I'd be I mean, interested in making a tea with it where test, you're, which is another way you're agitating, you're aerating, you're feeding uh, fish and, and mol the well, too. molasses yeah. for yeah. bacteria yeah. and fish. Sure. And, 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 and then you're brewing a tea, so uh, like a small tea bag. Sounds of this. like a great experiment. Yeah. 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 yeah, Absolutely, go for it. You know, the simplicity appeals to me, but if there's an elegance there that appeals to you, do it. Well, it's a way to increase the volume. I typically just do extra. Which is just In like running tests, water we can right through. Uh -huh. like, uh -huh. like it's I can coffee and like water runs right through it, and uh -huh. that water gets. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you've gotten the compost, and the, sort of the goal of the uh, of the process is to get it all to the point where everything is now uh, uh, quiescent. Uh, what's the word I'm looking at? Uh, not, not late. On. Oh, come on, it's dormant. Uh -huh. uh, if it's all, if pretty much all the carbon, all the excess carbon is gone, beneath yeah. it, everything just goes like say, dormant, yeah, and that's when it's ready. Uh -huh. Now, if you don't get that far, you probably need to apply at a higher rate. Uh, but in the dormant state, apparently this stuff will last for a few years as long as you keep it wet. Um, so it's very undemanding that way. Uh, and <laughs> at that point, you know, uh, if you run water through and you're extracting microbes, well, you'll, you'll generate more and biology will continue until it runs out of food. And at that point... five more minutes together, so I want to make sure if we have any final questions that we get the chance to ask them um, and then uh, spend a few minutes cleaning up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know if you, if you all heard, we were yeah, just talking okay. about application. Yeah, I thought there through. might be a question yeah. around that and making, you know, yeah. it's not, it's not necessarily yeah, just like, yeah, let, yeah, you're, not laying, person, yeah, you're not broadcasting like, from, from the genius. Yeah. 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 That's right. Slurry yeah. Making a, a very, oh, very thin slurry. Yeah, it's water to Right. It's nothing fancy. That's right. Just mix it with water and then pour it on. Yeah. That's what you did to your trees? Uh, no, actually, I, I just, just, dumped this just dumped it on the surface. Your extra material. You just extra material, like. Uh, and I think using different feedstocks, I think where we failed is we weren't adapting. Like, when we, when we, we did the air thing, thing, or, Yeah, we have to do yeah, sure. the thing. It's like we need to, we need to use a different material. I am going to take a little bit if that's okay. Please do. Yeah, me too. I have my well, wildlife well, festival, well, so this will be great for the students. There's the, the whole the, the bucket here. Can I get some of this, specifically this coir? Oh, yeah. Cool. yeah. So what, what's the difference well, between this and like, people like to I will, do compost yeah. tea? Yeah. Well, I mean, a, a compost tea is a way of uh, sort of concentrating it and, 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 and aerate it and all that. But, the, you know, uh, one of the things that appeals to me about this is that it's kind of, you know, it gives it, you something you can spray. You, can cover, you know, if you have a liquid right. with the tea. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Tea. You have a tea bag that's right. got your solids, yeah. and you're just having a lot of the nutrients and stuff but since, into the water. There's a difference between an extract and a tea, right? So an extract yeah. is when you're just like a tea bag. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 Right.
fish and molasses, fish for the fungus. Okay, I just figured it's aerated or non aerated. Okay. So, like, yeah. Elaine Ingham teaches how to make, there's a big difference, she says, in making compost tea versus compost extract. And I think compost it would be a wonderful thing aerated. to test. You know? And whether you add, bump in oxygen or not makes a huge not, difference. Yes, yeah, uh -huh. otherwise you're just drowning your organisms. We'll yeah, you, or you get a completely different community. Yeah. So this, this isn't an extract or a tea. This would be like your primary material. But let's say that you, you put this in like a 400 micrometer mesh bag, soaked it in water for 24 hours with some air. That's an yeah, extract. Let's say you add well, a what bunch you, of... Once you're applying it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But if you applied a bunch of foods to it, like kelp meal, glacial rock dust, Just move this uh, yeah. off, maybe we'll this. This piece and you brew it yeah. like that with, with air for like 24, 48 hours, maybe. that's more of a tea. Okay. And then you're you're actually increasing the number of organisms because you're creating the conditions with air and food, and then they're being put out with their food. And temperature is really important too, and you don't want to use just tap water because that might have chlorine stuff. in it. Yeah, right. So there, it, it, uh, there are some great videos out there if you can't afford Elaine's class, but there's some great videos, there are lots of videos um, on how to make a properly brewed compost tea. And she okay. actually wrote like an 80 page primer on it. It's like a free PDF you can find online that yeah. really goes through all the details. Yeah. And it's good It's good to know because it is a more efficient way to like administer compost, especially in like a garden where you're trying to like really target your application. Right. Although it depends on what you mean by efficiency in that case. Uh, to me, it's all, you know, uh, if there's some particular uh, species you want to encourage, well, then doing a, an extract of some sort and then, uh, do, you know, trying to feed the species that you want. Right. Uh, maybe that makes sense. And, that, and that's fine. If that works for you, please do it. Right. But one that's of the big things. Context is really important right. before you decide on what's what's right? But I think the uh, one of the big uh, issues yeah. with this stuff is that uh, uh, the sort of the thing is that it's incredibly diverse, yeah. Yeah. and and it has grown more diverse over the course of time, uh, and so therefore. Um, uh, so you know, like, if you anything you do to encourage one species over another makes it less diverse. And so from, from that sort of theoretical standpoint, uh, there could well be disadvantages to brewing a, uh, a, a, a tea or something. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, I, get, I was wondering because, um, but, um, like, I know there's, there's one of the concrete studies that yeah. show like, it was that compost yeah. tea is yeah, good. But I know there's a lot of people that like, stand by compost tea, but there's no like sure. scientific no study do it too, that says, like, this is like, what better than yeah. it. Is the it's better than like, I didn't know if this system has like, that study. turned a lot less. Uh, uh, it's proven it, more so. Yeah. Uh, well, over time, David has tried various application methods. Uh, pretty early on, he uh, came to a, uh, a, a technique where he'd apply uh, 200 or 400 pounds per acre uh, the, the day before it rained. And so he would be quite careful to try to apply it just before it rained so the water would t tend to wash, uh, disperse it, and carry microbes into the soil and all that. And that worked really well for a, a long time. And then he just thought more about it and then said, well, if I just mix it with water and apply that either as an inoculant onto the seed or into the seed furrow when I'm doing a seed drill, uh, and he uses the exact same uh, liquid fertilizer mechanism that yeah. is just standard with seed drills. So he didn't need to... Yeah, you're trying, you'd want to try to work with the equipment. Work with the equipment, have. which is one of the things I think is really well, well thought out, you know, that, you know, it's simple and it works. <sighs> you know, okay. So... Uh, I, I, you know, I take a, I, I really admire his way of thinking about that. But you know, your question uh, of, is it good? It's all a good for what? Yeah. Right. Different, right. different right. composts are different. Right. They're good for different yeah. things. Yeah, what are you growing? So I often call it like, like a designer compost. Yeah. You know, even when it comes to pathogens, this recipe and composition is different for, say, bacterial versus fungal pathogens or 
depends on if your path is obligate parasite or potentially a saprophyte. So uh, I just wanted to have a couple of concluding sort of comments here. Uh, the uh, uh, I really like what we saw here. Uh, it's not quite as far along as I had hoped. It's not bad. It's it's, it's good. It's better than the previous batch. That's good. Uh, no odors. No odors. No odors. That was a plus for sure. Big plus. Yeah. Picture of your setup. Uh, I actually I think we saw it right. <laughs> pretty, pretty much. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a big plastic. Uh, How many buckets uh, are you running? Uh, two. Oh, just two. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Small scale. Small scale, and then uh, and the two, inch, two inch, yeah, yeah, yeah. two inch thick uh, styrofoam uh, panels, yeah. duct taped into place. <laughs> Got to get the duct tape in there. So you have a, a, you basically have a box around it to control that. Yeah, well, that, that, that styrofoam is the insulated box. Yeah, yeah that's all. Exactly. Just duct tape into place right. styrofoam. But I, I would like to make a pitch uh, for this approach because, hey, it worked in my cellar and my wife didn't smell it. And mm -hmm. that's a huge yeah. achievement that's right there. That's a huge achievement. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, so I think it's applicable on the small scale. The other thing is, I'm really excited about the potential of this approach for research because, frankly, you, you have a, a giant uh, reactor that stands five feet tall, mm -hmm. uh, weighs a ton. E, you know, re replicating that is a lot of work. This, you know, David said he thought this was going to be fine. There are other researchers who say, yeah, I think that's going to work. And I think it was working. So uh, I think there are probably a thousand. Uh, variations on this that I would love to see tested. And, you know, if you do, say, three, uh, three five gallon uh, 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 of, of each test type, you know, you, you've at least duplicated the basic test. And then, you know, so you've got your control, three of your control, three of each variation. And then just, a, you know, a, a regular rack of shelves, you can conduct a dozen or two dozen experiments. This is really doable. And you know, if other people can improve uh, their technique from what I've done, you know, let's all learn from my mistakes, then you can learn from yours too. Works. <laughs> right. Uh, then uh, you know, people uh, who want to do this for themselves uh, can share the information with neighbors who say, oh, yeah, that, you're, you're your your uh, uh, hybrid uh, chestnuts looking really good there. I want to try that. Yeah. Tell them how to do it, you know, and it's very doable. Or if you've got a, a small research opportunity, you know, take take your three best or ten best guesses as to I should be testing for this and do it. And so that's the the real value of the five gallon bucket approach to Chance and Sue, I think. Any other takeaways? Five gallon bucket drew me in. <laughs> yeah, very low labor. Yeah. 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 Low cost, low labor. Do you cap when you put stuff in there? Uh, for the smell? Like, do you no. food it, you know? No. If there's I, smell, you're doing it wrong. If there's yeah. smell. Yeah, and, right. and I do try to uh, make sure there's some uh, loose leaves, wet leaves on top. That's the only capping I do. Right. How, do you keep it, how do you control the temperature? Uh, I've got a, a, a mat. Uh, for uh, warming seedlings, uh, and I taped it onto this one. You can see the green duct tape that I used to tape the uh, uh, the mat to the side of it. Uh, right, more, uh, and uh, uh, the other bucket didn't get quite as much heat, uh, but it seems to have reacted very, very similarly, and they're right next to each other inside an insulated box, so no surprise. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you.